Hi, I'm Phil Harbottle, and this is my 61st video discussing British science fiction. In this video, I'm looking at how I came to create some more science fiction comic strips after the Dan Day radio series had finished. 1957 was the height of the space race between Russia and America, both planning to send unmanned spacecraft to orbit the moon. It was also the International Geophysical Year when science was celebrated across the media. I'd also discovered three brilliant second-hand science fiction postal booksellers, Ken Slater, G. Ken Chapman, and Les Johnson's Millcross Book Service in Liverpool. Having heroically now taken on two daily paper rounds, before and after school, I was able to earn enough money to buy scores and scores of vintage magazines and second-hand science fiction books from their monthly catalogues. I revelled in all this, and it was as if my brain became a kettle that had finally come to the boil and now had to blow off steam. I was suddenly seized with ideas for a new science fiction comic strip and set to work in November 1957 on a story I called the coming of the Cosmutants. My story opens with an unmanned air rocket, a three-stage rocket, setting out to orbit the moon and photograph it and take record recordings before returning to Earth. But it's struck by a meteorite, or a meteor rather, it wasn't a meteorite, struck by a meteor, causing it to crash on the moon. Now I imagined the moon as being rich in unstable uranium and it unites with the rocket's atomic engine to produce a tremendous chain reaction, plunging the moon into the throes of an atomic cataclysm. Be it noted that this was some 17 years before Jerry and Sylvia Anderson pretty much used the same idea for Space 99, 1999. Alas, I would never receive any money or recognition for having first thought of the idea. Large areas of the moon disintegrate and the moon is drawn towards the Earth and begins to break up. Giant meteors pulverise the earth and millions perish. Millions of people perish. Civilization is shattered. Worse follows as people find huge lumps developing on their arms. We see at the bottom panel there. Now, we see on this page here, the scientist explains that for millennia, the unprotected moon has absorbed cosmic rays like a sponge. Now that huge lunar fragments had fallen to Earth, they were dissipating and transmitting this radiation, affecting people by causing lumps on their bodies. And soon these lumps burst like pustules we we'll see there, the burst like pustules and emerging is a tiny imp-like creature. It is the coming of the cosmutants. The creatures then kill their parent bodies and drain their blood like vampires. After three days, now grown to four feet in height, the Cosmutants seek others of their kind. We learn that the creatures have been cloned, developing from a single human cell, which is actually a complete being in itself. In 1954, I'd never heard of cloning, of course, but I had absorbed the idea of a single cell being from reading Vorgo Statton's The Multiman. The book we see here. 
Now, for the first time, the full force of cosmic rays have been unleashed on the Earth and on striking a human cell have imbued it with life force. But they've also slightly altered the genes so that instead of exact clones, they've mutated into little green imps, which lack the ability to produce red, their own red corpuscles, hence the vampirism. The cell people have also inherited all mental attributes and memories, which is how they can speak and think. Now, let's see on this page, there are three men who have been trapped deep underground during the lunar bombardment now emerge and are attacked by the cosmutants. But when they defend themselves, they are shocked to find that their punches inflict terrible damage. The cosmutants instantly decay and dissolve when they're damaged. Now, when the, when the people move on to the next town, the nearest town, they hear a loudspeaker announcement calling on any surviving humans of the radiation disaster to go to a specified house and descend a trapdoor into an underground shaft where they emerge into a huge nuclear bunker. A group of scientists had constructed a bunker fully equipped with air conditioning, food supplies and laboratories for insulation against atom bombs radiation in the event of war and had been able to escape into it when the lunar bombardment had occurred. The leader of the scientists is a young man named Russell Vargo, which is a bit of a giveaway that was being inspired by the Vargo Staten novels. On learning from the newcomers that the Cosmutants are fatally vulnerable to any blows, when they learn what happened to the Cosmutants when they were attacked, The scientists quickly deduced that unlike multi-celled human beings, the cosmutants are a single hypertrophied cell. Damage it and it will shrivel and die like a punctured balloon. This fanciful MacGuffin was of course directly inspired by Fern's Staten novel, The Multi-Man. Multi -Man. We learn that the scientists are developing spaceships and had been intending to intervene from space if any powers had started a world war. The first spaceship is now ready and Vargo is to pilot it on its first test flight into space. Let's see there. But his rocket, as we see on this page, is struck by a large meteor. Space is still strewn with lunar debris, remember, and Vargo is knocked unconscious. When he eventually comes round, he finds that his spaceship is out of fuel and charging through space at constant velocity. Charging through space at constant velocity. Worse still, the ship's damaged hull has allowed the cosmic radiation in space, there's the damaged hull, but that allows the cosmic radiation in space to infect Fargo, and he now gives birth to a cosmutant. Inheriting Fargo's knowledge that a heavy blow can kill it, 
the cosmic and scuttles away and hides in the ship. But Vargo is ready for it when it returns for his blood and he kills it in spectacular fashion. Now his ship has reached the asteroid belt and its gravity pull retards its speed and turns the ship around. Now when, I say on that page, when Vargo ejects the remains of the dead cosmic into space, it explodes on contact with an asteroid rock fragment. And Vargo promptly deduces that the asteroids are the, must be the remains of an atomically exploded planet. And each fragment is a potential atomic bomb. I borrowed these fanciful ideas from Vargo Staten's The Black Avengers book. See there. After patching his own ship's hull, our brilliant scientist now tours a collection of asteroids with a magnetic beam, which you see on the bottom panels there. And he also constructs a vacuum beam projector, which he'll use when he gets back to Earth. Vargo then drops his improvised atomic bombs onto the Earth down a vacuum channel, which prevents them from exploding or burning up as they would by striking air. He knows that my party will be underground, protected from all this, but the Cosmutants won't. The Cosmutants get atomic radiation source. And being a single cell, they all die horribly. Borgo returns to Earth and his underground uh, bunker, informing the scientists that the Cosmutants are dead. When the radiation dies out, we can reclaim the Earth and build up the human race again. Phew, that was quite an epic, but I still had plenty of ideas, so I immediately plunged into the sequel, The Scum Creatures. Two years have passed and Vorgo's underground domain is becoming too small, following several births. But the radiation has now dropped below danger level, so Vorgo leads a party to the surface to assess where they can start rebuilding and make a fresh start for the human race. Investigating the stench coming from a stagnant stream, they are shocked to see hideous purple creatures emerging from the scum on the surface. The biologist Kirkley unwisely picks up one of the creatures, which immediately bites him like a snake, injecting the contents of a sack on its back. He collapses and is transmuted into liquid scum. The creatures then gobble up his remains, and half an hour later, nothing remains but the claws. The scum creatures have slipped back into the dark filth from whence they came. Back in the underground uh, refuse, Mrs. Kirkney is given the bad news of her husband's death. And Vargo rationalises what has happened. Now that the earth no longer has a moon, the seas are tideless. All silt carried down by rivers to the sea is building up into an increasing load of filth on the coasts and blocked rivers have become stagnant. An ideal breeding ground for germs and the cosmic irradiation has mutated these germs to gigantic size, thriving in the filth which is covering the globe. 
Paul goes down the pressure suit and returns to the stagnant stream, armed with explosive charges and carrying a metal specimen box. Vargo plants explosive charges to destroy the local scum creatures, but collects a specimen for his chemist to examine and determine how it might be killed. They find that the creatures have a weird metabolism. The bodies secrete a catabolic solution which reduces protoplasm to a rubbly liquid on which they can feed and replenish their poison. The chemist reports that the creatures are immune to all poisons and can only be destroyed by fire explosives, remarking that we have as much chance of killing them as we have of getting the moon back. This gives Vargo his great idea to actually make the earth a new moon. With another moon, the tides will start again the scum will be washed away into the open seas and in time it will vanish and the scum creatures with it. But how to make a new moon? Once again, I reached into the treasure chest of 52 Vargo Statinals for inspiration and Vargo comes up with a solution from the sun makers. That's the sun makers. The solution is by using the matter into energy, energy into matter laws. The scientists construct power stations at the North and South Poles, tapping the Earth's enormous electrical and magnetic fields. The polar stations then beam energy to two orbiting spaceships. You see there. The energy is beamed to the two orbiting spaceships, which in turn retransmit the energies to a point in space above the equator. You see there. Universal forces, the creator's tools, collide in outer space. The result is a violent warp of energy producing matter. All right. With the new moon in place, it exerts its gravitation once again on the tides, and the filth is washed clear on the coasts, and fresh water rivers once more flow freely. With all sources of scum now washed away, the mutant germs become cannibals and consume themselves into extinction. And here we see my uplifting last panel with its legend, The End. However, it wouldn't be the end of my obsession with comic strips, as we'll see in my next video.